Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Hello again. Uh, this is the uh, uh, sixth sixth lecture in week four of this course, Fundamentals of Atomic Force Microscopy. This is a course part one. Uh, there's going to be a separate part two of this course, which is going to be strictly devoted to dynamic AFM. Uh, the topic of this particular lecture is the lateral force microscope. Um, this lateral force microscope is a, a, a very rapid development from the atomic force microscope. Um, it's very easy to perform lateral force images. Uh, it's much more difficult to understand in detail uh, the quantitative features of those lateral force images. And what I like to do in this lecture is just provide an overview of, of lateral force microscopy and try to show you that it, uh, the uh, AFM with just a slight modification is capable of providing some very interesting information on friction, which is a very, um, very old topic. It goes back hundreds of years. Uh, of course, before the invention of the atomic force microscope, all studies of uh, friction were at the mic macro scale. <clears throat> uh, basically involved uh, studying the uh, forces required to move one object uh, past another. And um, the difficulty was that the frictional forces that were measured, uh, of course, depended on the uh, surface roughness of the two materials that were being slid over one with respect to another. So it was very difficult to uh, accurately determine the contact area that was actually touching uh, the, as the two, uh, two materials were slid one, over, one across the other. This problem was solved uh, in a very, ra very rapid fashion by realizing that if you use the atomic force microscope and the tip uh, as one of the objects, uh, uh, you could go from this macroscale friction to a nanoscale friction measurement and you could simply take, take advantage of the very high, uh, aspect ratio of a typical AFM tip to get information at the atomic level of how uh, one atom slides across a surface that's contained, uh, that contains another, uh, another uh, atom that could be chemi chemically completely different. <clears throat> so uh, a lot of interesting fundamental questions can be asked and answered uh, with, with the uh, lateral friction microscope. How does the uh, lateral friction uh, microscope work, the LFM? Uh, well, it's schematically shown here. Um, what we have to say is uh, something about the lateral, the friction forces that are acting on the tip when the tip is in contact with the substrate. And traditionally, the ratio of the loading force uh, to the lateral force uh, that's, that ratio is given uh, by one number called the coefficient of friction. It's referred to as mu in this diagram. And typically, coefficients of friction lie somewhere between a small number on the order of, let's say, 0.01 up to uh, values that approach unity. And so that implies that if you have a, a normal force that's, let's say, 100 nanonewtons, that implies that these lateral or friction forces uh, lie in the range between one to 100 nanonewtons. Uh, these lateral forces in this, in this range can then be measured uh, with a cantilever sensor. Uh, they're in fact on the same order as uh, the, the normal forces that, that we use when we perform contact, contact mode AFM scans. So, uh, the question then becomes to, you know, how do you design a cantilever uh, and what are you going to measure uh, on that cantilever uh, that will give you information about these lateral or frictional forces that, that act between the tip and the substrate? Well, there's uh, some intuition that you can use immediately, right? If, if you want to maximize uh, the lateral force signal, basically what's going to happen is the lateral force signal is going to cause the cantilever to twist. Uh, by a small, through a small angle. Uh, 
Uh, and if you want to optimize that twist, if you want to make that twist as large as possible, you typically want to use long cantilevers that are very thin and uh, have long tips. Um, and then the issue is going to be how do you calibrate uh, the, the twist of the cantilever, how do you calibrate that uh, with the lateral force that was required to produce that twist. That turns out to be uh, an interesting and challenging experimental problem. Um, we have to we have to first say something about the relevant spring constants for a twisting cantilever. Uh, the uh, experiment that uh, you have to think through uh, to calibrate the, the spring or to calculate the spring constant of a twisting cantilever is indicated in this slide. Basically, we're asking the question if you uh, if you displace the substrate, if you bring the tip into contact with the substrate, and then you displace the substrate by a, a distance delta x, how much does the cantilever twist? At what angle delta phi does the cantilever twist? This parameter delta phi is referred to as the torsional deformation of the cantilever, and the relevant uh, uh, geometric parameters are sketched out uh, as shown in the, in the diagram. Uh, of course, what's basically going to happen is the lateral or the frictional force between the tip and the substrate is going to exert a torque on the cantilever. The, the moment arm of that torque is going to be the, just the, the height of the tip that's given by capital H in this diagram. Uh, and, and, and that torque or that moment applied to the cantilever uh, uh, is going to cause the cantilever to twist by an amount delta phi. So, the, um, the amount that the cantilever will twist is, is clearly going to be proportional to the torque, and it's also going to be proportional to the length of the cantilever L. So you can set up a proportionality between cantilever twist and the torque and the cantilever length, as I've indicated. If you want to turn that proportionality into an equation, you have to introduce some, uh, some constant of proportionality. And from the uh, theory of uh, elasticity of, of uh, beams, that proportionality constant is related to the shear modulus of the material that makes up the cantilever. It's related to the width of the cantilever W. Uh, the thickness cubed comes in, uh, right? And, and uh, these, this, is, this is then the proportionality constant that, that tells you the relationship between the twist angle phi and the applied torque. Uh, to the uh, to the base of the tip. Uh, um, the um, I think I think it's 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 probably more conventional to talk about the lateral force and the displacement. I mean, you've got two choices here. I guess that's the way to say it, right? You can focus you can focus on the uh, torque and the angle uh, that, that the torque produces. You can focus on the torque uh, and the uh, lateral force that, that rotates the, the cantilever through an angle delta phi. And so the last equation on this slide, I just try to work through uh, an expression that relates the lateral force to the displacement delta x. Uh, that gives rise to the spring constant case of x, which is referred to as the lateral uh, spring constant of a cantilever. It's related to the torsional spring constant uh, case of phi, and, and that, that relationship is sort of uh, sketched out in this particular slide. <clears throat> You've got two choices. You can focus on the twist angle or the displacement delta x. Uh, there's two different spring constants uh, that are uh, closely related, uh, one to the other, uh, uh, just depending on what, what, what your, I guess it's a, pr a preference it, to me. It, there's no difference between the two. It's just what you uh, prefer to, to discuss. Um, it's interesting to compare, let's say, the lateral spring constant k sub x to the, uh, the spring constant k that we've used to discuss the deflection of the cantilever in the, uh, in the z direction. Right? Uh, it's, it's useful to get a sense of how, how those two numbers are, are related one to another. And so in this slide, I actually go through and I do this comparison between a lateral spring constant, k sub x, uh, it's proportional to the shear modulus of the material, uh, 
<clears throat> I compare that to the normal spring constant K, uh, which is proportional to the Young's modulus of the material. I uh, just calculate the ratio of the spring constants, and then I point out that um, uh, the shear modulus can be related to the Young's modulus if if the the if the cantilever material is isotropic and homogeneous, you can write down a very simple relationship between G and E. It involves Poisson's ratio, and at the end of the day, you can convince yourself that the ratio of the lateral spring constant to the Z constant of the uh, Z spring constant of the cantilever that quantity is much much greater than one. And uh, just to illustrate that point, there's a, a, a nice plot I found in the literature that indicates the ratio of the two spring constants. Uh, I believe the material for the uh, that this calculation was done for is silicon, uh, right? You can see how that ratio uh, varies as a function of uh, the length of the cantilever L, and there are also different uh, tip heights H given. So the Typically, uh, for the range of uh, parameters that you can uh, make cantilevers experimentally, uh, right, the ratio of the spring constants is, is clearly much greater than one. Uh, certainly, when you get out to cantilevers that are greater than a few hundred microns in length. So, this sort of sets the scale and it shows you that uh, the lateral or the, the twisting spring constant is going to be much higher than the uh, spring constant that characterizes the up and down motion of the cantilever. How would you, uh, how would you measure the lateral force? Well, uh, to measure the lateral force, you clearly have to measure how much the cantilever twists. And it turns out that's reasonably easy to do using this quadrented uh, position sensitive detector that's built into to all atomic force microscopes. So here now, I just make the case that uh, if the, uh, if the cantilever bends in the Z direction, there'll be an output from the photodiode. Uh, let's call that output delta V sub N. N. N refers to the normal deflection of the cantilever. If the cantilever is now going to twist due to this uh, lateral force, uh, then basically the, laser, the reflected laser spot is going to move in a direction uh, uh, 90 degrees from the uh, a direction that's produced when a cantilever bends up and down. And so that uh, lateral displacement of the, uh, let's, well, let's call it the horizontal displacement of the laser spot across the position sensitive detector will give rise to a voltage which we refer to as delta phi, uh, delta V sub phi, that's the lateral signal. And uh, both these signals can be read out independently, uh, just requires separate operational amplifiers to sum up the various voltages in different ways. And so simultaneously, you can measure both delta V sub N and delta V sub phi in virtually any atomic force microscope that, uh, that, that you might be using. So <clears throat> it's useful to uh, just do a, a simple uh, force balance uh, type analysis in a static uh, situation. Uh, we imagine a cantilever moving from left to right. Uh, we imagine a frictional force acting between the tip and the substrate. That frictional force causes the cantilever basically to stick. Uh, um, the cantilever is loaded against the substrate by a force F sub load. And a lateral, uh, a lateral force will be developed at right angles to the axis of the cantilever, and that lateral force or that torsional force is going to cause the cantilever to twist through that angle delta phi. If you just do a simple force balance equation, you can convince yourself that you basically got one equation and one unknown, and that means that if you can accurately measure delta phi, you can then work backwards and solve for the uh, coefficient of friction mu that appears in that top equation. Uh, the, the difficulty with this very simple-minded approach is that you have to know the uh, parameters uh, very accurately, and uh, this requires a calibration. Very, it's, it's very unwise to just plug numbers in uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the equations. I mean, it's a useful exercise, but it's, it's not adequate to interpret experimental data. Experimentally, you got to go in and measure those uh, those two spring constants, K, uh, K and K sub X.
So um, just a few examples of, of uh, uh, lateral uh, or frictional force maps. Uh, first example is a, a study we did here at, at Purdue uh, where you, de you just deposit oxidized graphene flakes onto, let's say, a, a, a substrate. In this case, the substrate was highly oriented pyrolytic graphite. Uh, the only difference between the substrate and the flakes are that the flakes are oxidized graphene, uh, and so uh, the tip is going to interact differently between uh, the, the HOPG substrate and the oxidized graphene substrate. And if you just uh, raster the tip across the, uh, uh, the, this, this, uh, this sample, uh, what you'll find is you'll find that the frictional force when the, between the tip and the oxidized graphene, that frictional force is higher than the frictional force that you you measure when the, the tip is, is uh, rastered across uh, the HOPG. And you can clearly display uh, the contrast that develops. The, the, the contrast is directly a, a measure of the twist angle. You can display that and, and uh, very clearly see uh, the regions where the uh, oxidized graphene is located compared to the highly oriented pyrolytic graphite. Uh, a, a, a drawback of the lateral force microscope is that the uh, uh, forces that the tip exerts on the substrate in the process of rastering, those forces can be rather large. And so here I take an example from the literature from the very early days. This goes back to 1995. Uh, in this particular study, silver nanoparticles were deposited onto an indium phosphide substrate. The tip was rastered in contact mode uh, across the uh, substrate. Uh, after the uh, uh, tip was rastered, the uh, sample was put into a scanning electron microscope and uh, images, uh, scanning electron microscope images clearly showed that the nanoparticles uh, were swept away uh, by the motion of the, of the tip across the substrate. <clears throat> so this very clearly shows that these lateral forces uh, can be used to dislodge uh, 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 weakly bound particulates to uh, uh, substrates. And uh, of course, this, this is one of the drawbacks of contact uh, mode uh, atomic force microscopy. It's one of the reasons why this dynamic mode AFM was uh, uh, was invented and, and why it's of such wide interest today to, to get around this problem. Uh, it's a fair question if you're going to uh, uh, try to calibrate the, uh, the lateral spring constant of a cantilever, how do you do that? And the answer is you somehow have to devise a technique uh, that generates a known lateral force. Now, if you read the literature, there are many many, many uh, proposals uh, made to solve this particular problem. Uh, some, of these, uh, some of these ways to, general, to generate known lateral forces are really quite complex and complicated. Uh, perhaps the simplest way to generate a lateral force is to uh, uh, produce a feature in the substrate that it's, that's inclined at a known angle theta with respect to the substrate. Uh, when you do this, and you then do a, let's say, a force versus Z displacement curve on that uh, inclined region of the substrate, right? Uh, there will be a, 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 a known lateral force generated, and that known lateral force is going to be related to the uh, uh, loading force of the, of the cantilever against the substrate, uh, and it's also going to re require knowledge of that, that uh, inclination angle theta. Uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is, is uh, perhaps illustrated more clearly in this slide. This just shows the uh, signals that would come out if you did a force versus D, Z displacement curve uh, uh, when the tip is positioned above the inclined region of the substrate. When you do that force versus displacement, you get the standard curve that, that we've discussed extensively in, in this week of the, of the course. But if you monitor the lateral signal, if you measure this delta V sub phi signal that comes from the position sensitive detector, uh, you'll see a signal that looks uh, something like uh, <clears throat> the, the one that's sketched in the, in the diagram, the bottom portion of this diagram. Uh, 
Let's focus on the uh, case when the, uh, the inclination angle theta is defined to be greater than zero. Uh, what you'll find is that, uh, what you should find is you should find a, an offset in the voltage coming from the photosensitive diode. That offset can be due to a lot of things. We're not terribly interested uh, about the offset right now, but uh, you should see an increase in the voltage from the uh, position sensitive diode that, that depends on the uh, displacement uh, of the tip with respect to the substrate, that's delta Z. So by measuring the change in the uh, output voltage uh, for a given change in the input voltage, or for a given change in Z, you could then infer uh, uh, the uh, lateral uh, spring constant of the cantilever. That, that provides you with a technique to calibrate uh, uh, the cantilever for lateral force microscopy. The technique can be generalized because you can imagine scanning a tip uh, over a feature that has this trapezoidal shape. Um, the, the voltages that will be generated as the tip scans across the surface under ideal circumstances, uh, the voltages, uh, the lateral signal that should be generated uh, is, is indicated in the bottom half of this slide. There'll be a clear offset voltage that's related to the uh, frictional force between the tip and the substrate. And then in principle, you should see an upward uh, signal when the tip scans over the first uh, sloping region. You should see a downward uh, signal uh, when the tip scans over the uh, downward sloping region of that uh, trapezoidal feature. And from measuring those voltages and knowing the lateral force, I'm sorry, knowing the, the loading force, you can, you can then back, back out the, the calibration of the, uh, the lateral calibration of the spring. Um, the difficulty is all these uh, schemes uh, rely on knowing uh, with great detail the, uh, the uh, shape, the geometric shape of your, uh, your probe. And uh, the things that I always worry about is if the tip does not lie exactly along the center line. In particular, if the apex of the tip is not aligned along the center line of the cantilever, uh, you'll get signals, you'll get contributions to these signals that are just related to that offset distance. And how to take all that into account and do a systematic calibration uh, is in fact a, a, a real challenge. And, and anyone that uh, reads the literature uh, uh, will I think come to the same conclusion. Uh, another technique that's commonly employed is this so-called friction loop. Uh, the idea here is you, uh, you basically raster the tip across the sample. You have a trace, a retrace feature that you have to implement in your atomic force microscope. When the tip goes uh, forward in the trace mode, uh, the, the frictional force acts in one direction, causes the cantilever to twist, as I've shown. Uh, when you do a retrace, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, cantilever will twist in the opposite direction, and that therefore implies that the frictional force and the twist of the cantilever will be opposite, and so therefore the change in the voltage, uh, uh, there should be a change in the voltage coming out of the photodiode. Uh, the gray cross-hatched area in this slide is, is an attempt to indicate that the area enclosed in that uh, uh, frictional loop is in some way related to the frictional work that's done in the process of, of going through this trace and this retrace uh, method. Uh, but this technique is often used to uh, uh, estimate the uh, coefficient of friction uh, by uh, making these uh, friction loop measurements for different loading forces and uh, the slope of the frictional force, which is proportional to the voltage that comes out of the uh, 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 position-sensitive detector, that voltage versus the applied load, the slope of that should be related to the uh, uh, coefficient of friction between the tip and the substrate. Uh, this technique has been uh, uh, implemented in a number of this frictional force technique or this frictional loop technique has been implemented in a number of ways. Just want to point out you can do these frictional loops on different regions of a substrate where which are inclined one with respect to another by known angles. Uh, 
and you start to generate a sequence of curves uh, which uh, uh, give you some ability to systematically eliminate some of the uncertainties that, that come into this whole analysis. So uh, this is a, a, a very useful technique and, and there's a reference that you can look up. It's, uh, it's a reference from the early days of AFM. So uh, it's a technique that's commonly employed. Uh, another problem that you'll run into is the fact that you have to make sure that the uh, uh, lateral and the, uh, and the normal signal from the position sensitive detector, those two voltages have to be uh, coupled one with respect to another. And they will be if you can ensure yourself that the laser deflection is in a vertical direction for an up and down motion of the cantilever. And uh, the uh, twisting of the cantilever, the lateral, due to the lateral force that produces a horizontal, strictly horizontal deflection of the laser beam across the position sensitive detector. Uh, when that's the case, then the voltages for the normal channel and the lateral channel are as indicated by the top, uh, top matrix. Uh, but however, if the uh, position sensitive detector is slightly misaligned, right, then uh, the two signals will get mixed. Uh, the measured signal for, let's say, the lateral channel will now contain a, 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 a component related to the normal force and uh, transformation uh, that, that, uh, uh, that's required to uh, deconvolute that uh, uh, addition of the normal force into the lateral channel. That, that, that deconvolution is indicated just by the rotation matrix uh, uh, involving cosine alpha and sine alpha. So it's very hard to get this alignment perfect. Uh, um, I'm, I don't think many uh, AFM companies uh, will spend a lot of time on the alignment. Um, and so this is something that you have to work out and convince yourself of once your instrument's in the lab, that, that uh, the alignment, well, you have to be able to characterize the alignment, right? That's the, the bottom line. And the last point I wanted to make is that if you uh, if you do these frictional loop studies and your scan range is only a few nanometers, right? What you'll find is that the uh, the uh, the frictional force, the the voltage coming out of the the, the voltage is proportional to the twist of the cantilever. Uh, that voltage can start to show a periodicity that's related to the atomic periodicity of atoms in the substrate. And uh, it gives rise to this stick-slip uh, frictional forces uh, that uh, were really uh, atomic scale friction events. Uh, these, uh, uh, this atomic periodicity was observed very early, 1987. Uh, uh, so within a year after the invention of the atomic force microscope, it was very clear that uh, the AFM could be used in the lateral force mode uh, to uh, study atomic scale friction, which is, of course, a very interesting question at a very fundamental level. So I uh, just wanted to point that out as, uh, as a point of reference uh, uh, on how this lateral force microscopy is, is interesting, at, not only at a very applied, but a very fundamental level. So this ends week four, right? Um, uh, next, uh, next week will be the last, last week of part one of this course. Uh, we're going to focus almost exclusively on running through a number of VEDA simulations to, uh, to uh, illustrate some of the topics that uh, we've covered in, uh, in this week, week four of the lectures. Uh, so we'll see you uh, next week and uh, we'll, we'll work through a number of simulations that, uh, that, are, that are quite interesting and can be done very easily in the, in the VEDA framework. So see you then. Thank you again.